In the 15th chapter of Corinthians, one of the most beautiful chapters in the Bible, that which thou sowest is not quickened except the dark, except the corn of wheat fall in the ground and die in the bite of the loom. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. So if I really and truly want Christ to come forth in me, the full grown man Christ Jesus, I have to surrender to a process of death. Listen to this beautiful truth. Ye are dead. Who can finish it? And your life is hid with Christ in God. For this, for this tulip to live, it has to die. It has to die. Ye are dead, but your life is hid with Christ in God. And if we want that light to come forth and be expressed, the old has to die that the new might live. And do you know when you plant this bulb in the ground, you forget all about this bulb, don't you? You forget all about this bulb. You're, you're done with it. You're through with it. You renounce it. You give it up. You die to it. And that's just exactly what this bulb has to do. We call it a bulb now, but when it's planted in the ground, we never, 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 ever refer to it as a bulb again. It loses its identity. And if we want Jesus Christ to be revealed in us, we have to give up our old identity, which we call our self-life, our self-life. And that old self-life is capable of an awful lot of expression, isn't it? All the works of the flesh, all the works of the flesh that uh, are mentioned in the Word of God. But I just want to speak of some self-complaining, self complaining, self-complacency and self-sufficiency and self-pity, self-seeking, self-defense, unyielding, driving, demanding, critical, self-interest, and we could just go on to all of the things that the old self is guilty of, selfishness, pride, hardness. Couldn't we say a lot more? But it's all wrapped up in one word, self. How many here would like to get rid of the whole crowd? The whole bunch and everything that has to do with it. You know, dear, we have to come to the place in God where, where once and for all we want to get rid of this thing called self. We want to get rid of the old carnal life and the old carnal man and the old carnal mind and all of those old expressions of self and carnality. We want to be done with them and we want to get through with them and live the Christ life. And in my life, this become as much a conviction as I was convicted that I wanted to be saved. I wanted to know the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior, and I wanted to be saved. And, and when that conviction gripped me enough, I gave my heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, and he saved me. And after I was saved, well, 
I, I tell you the truth with me. It was not only after I was saved, but it was after I was baptized in the Holy Ghost because I was saved and received the baptism of the Spirit, the same service. The first time I went to the altar, I was saved and received the baptism. But I found out that the old man wasn't taken out of me root and branch. And, uh, and in tests and in trials, there were, there were still temptations. And there were still expressions of the old man. And there were still things there, reactions and resentments and unbrokenness and pride and things that I didn't know what to do with and how to handle and I didn't think they belonged in a Christian's life and they don't belong in a Christian's life and I came to the place that in God that I was as convicted of carnality as I was convicted of sin and then I began to find these scriptures in the word of God that I should be saved and cleansed from all filthiness of flesh and spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of God there's a lot of people that they don't drink anymore and they don't carouse anymore and they don't go out with other people's wives anymore and they do not commit outlandish sins, they don't steal, and they don't do things that would send them to prison anymore, but there can be an awful lot of carnality in, 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 in word, in conversation, worldliness in our ways, worldliness in our conversation, worldliness in attitudes and actions, and again this thing of of resentment and people think they have perfect liberty today and blowing their tops as they say and expressing themselves and nobody's going to walk over me no I'm not going to do that and I know one woman in fact she said it in my prison she says I just I said Lord will you please turn your back while I tell this man what I think <laughs> but uh, we just, we can't live like that. And, and that's not very much of a Christian witness, is it? It certainly is not. We, that, and he says we must be cleansed of all the filthiness of the flesh. That's those outward sins that anybody condemns, that society condemns. But sins of flesh and spirit. And the sins of the spirit are just as big sins in the sight of God as sins of the flesh. Sin is sin and it must be dealt with and we must condemn it and it must be put away. And God brings us to crises in our life where these things are exposed and where we have to do something about it. And in the the scriptures we can see one after another of God's children in in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, he says, well, he tells us another another scripture in 1 Corinthians eleven thirty one. If you judge yourself, you will not be judged in these things. But then God creates a crisis in our life, and He'll bring us to a crisis to expose to us what's in us. And Moses, you remember Moses? Moses was trained in Pharaoh's court and he thought he was just getting along fine and God had called him to deliver Israel. Well, he was going to deliver Israel, all right. He got him a sword. And he went out and met an Egyptian and, and he killed him. Well, that's not the way God's way of doing things. And then after he killed him, he realized he had done something wrong, and he hit that man in the sand. Well, God, God can send the wind along, too. And the wind came along and exposed that man hit in the sand. And when the Egyptians found him, then they wanted to kill Moses and get rid of him. And Moses was brought to a crisis. And, and you see, he had... Moses had all this fire, all this fire in him that he was going to deliver Israel. But it was the wrong kind of fire. And God had to take him out to the desert and defire him. And 
And so he kicked him out of the desert for 40 years to defire him, to get all that natural fire out of him and put in him, put in him the right kind of burning love and compassion for Israel that he would go in there and deliver them with just a little rod in the name of Almighty God and the power of the wonderful Holy Spirit. And when God sent Moses back to deliver them by the power of the Spirit, Moses cried that he wouldn't have to go alone, that somebody else could go and speak, because he had already gotten plenty of trouble. And, and he brought Moses to a crisis, and he brought Abraham to a crisis. When he asked Abraham to take his son Isaac the thing in his life that he loved more than anything else in the world, his own son Isaac, through whom the promised child was to come. And Abraham had prayed, and God promised him Isaac, and God promised that through him, eventually the Christ would come. And now God asked him if he'll give up the thing in his life that means more to him than anything else in all the world. Will you give up Isaac? Will you surrender Isaac to me? Will you surrender it? And it took Abraham a little while to come to the place where he made that complete 100% consecration. But Abraham came to the place. He walked, the word says, three days. Three days to the mount that God called him to. Here's another three in the scripture, which means death and burial and resurrection. But by the time he got there, there was a resurrection in him. And he was able to put that son on the altar and surrender him to the Lord. Abraham died to Isaac. Moses had to die to all that human natural thing in him that would deliver Israel uh, with the human, with, with human implements, with his human implements. Just, just, just let me handle this. Just let me take care of this. Just let me talk to them. Just let me get in here and handle this situation. And this is the way people do things today. This way, ooh, in this day of pressure, in the, the carnality that's everywhere, you, in the world, in the world, it's, it's expressed out there as fallen human nature. Fallen human nature. When God created Adam, he was a perfect man in the likeness and image of God. But, but he turned his back against God, and he lost all of God that was in him, and became a purely natural man. And, and, and the fallen nature of that, that is capable of anything. When, and you see fallen man and, and the ugliness today, today all the ugliness of fallen man is beginning to be exposed. And, and I don't know why it is, but I don't, I don't, I like to look at news on television and I do when I can. And once in a while, in a home, I see a program. But, but I wonder why it is in all television programs, they try to bring out all of the ugliness that's in man. They want to bring out all the devil that's in man. They want to, even in question programs and uh, they in, in interviews, they don't ask people anything that good that's in them. They want them to express the very worst that's in them. How do you feel? And don't you hate her? And get in a fight. And, and even little children are taught to break up and destroy and break down and, and ruin and wreck. And, and all the ugliness that is in man is brought out on the scene everywhere today. When we receive the Lord, 
He's in there. He's in there. But there's that old nature that's still in there too. How many of you have found out that you're, you're like two people? You're like two people. Yes? All right. And, and we're Siamese twins, really. We're like Siamese twins. We're two people. And the doctor has said, now only one of these natures can live. And so one has to die so the other can live. And you and I constantly are brought to a place of choice where we have to choose which nature is going to die and which one is going to live. And in every crossroad that we come to, it calls for decision. Every test that we get in, it calls for decision. Whether, we're, whether the old nature is going to live or the new man in Christ Jesus is going to live. But the Lord brings us to a place where we get convicted about the expressions of this old man, his temper and carnality and what he is capable of. And as I say again, I was as convicted of carnality as I was of sin and had to come to a place where once and for all we make the decision whether I'm going to live and have my own way or accept a corn of wheat, fall in the ground and die. If I just want to be Hattie Hammond and act like Hattie Hammond and express the Hammond nature and go the way I want to go and do what I want to do and be what I want to be, my own plans, my own will, my own desires, if I want to go that way, then then Jesus Christ is forever kept him imprisoned within me. And the time will come. You know, you can't live like that forever. You can't live like that forever. We go on like that until the soul that sinneth, it shall not. Now, some folks tell you once you have been saved that uh, you never can be lost. But the Bible does not teach that. The soul that sinned, it shall die. And it doesn't matter what experience I have had. If I sin, I die. <laughs> and I have to come to the place where I'm willing to lose my identity that Jesus Christ can live. Now this is your old carnal nature. Do you want to get rid of that thing? How many of you do? How many of you, how many of you don't? Believe me, if you have ever had an exposure of your true self, there isn't anything there like. I don't care what your name is. I don't care where you were born. I don't care what you were. I don't care about that. If you ever really, truly get a picture of yourself, there isn't anything there to be proud of. How many will say amen? amen. And you'd like to get rid of that thing. There's only one way to get rid of it once and for all. Commit it to its death. And bring it to Jesus Christ and say, Lord, I hate that thing. And I surrender it to you. And he says, all right. All right. And then we come to this beautiful scripture. If he's going to increase, What's going to happen to me? I must decrease. I must decrease. That's right. And how can these things be? Thou fool. Thou fool. He says, how can this be? Except it fall in the ground and not die. So we take the old self-life and surrender it. To the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he doesn't he doesn't kill it and crucify it once and for all and that's the end of it. But we come to a place of 100% consecration where we commit that old self life and all there is of us we commit it to Jesus. To the Lord, we we deliberately, literally let it fall into the ground and die. We put it in the hands of the Lord. We judge it. We pass judgment on it. That's wrong. And I don't want it any 
holy time of consecration to God. 100% plus. And then the Lord takes over. That's the old you. That's the, the old man. The old man, we call it. That's the old you, whether it's the old man or the old woman. Sometimes it's the old man and sometimes it's the old woman. But anyhow, we bring it to Jesus and are willing for that self faith to fall in the ground and die. And die. And, and give ourselves to Jesus Christ and let him, let him deal with this thing. And he begins to he takes us in his hand and begins to deal with us. And there must be a renouncing of ourself and a giving up of ourself 100%. I have to, I give up myself and whatever I know. And I hear Jesus, just, just take my life. Take it. Take everything. Take everything. Take my life. You men have to give up your lives. Have you given them up? Say something. <laughs> you women have to give up your husbands. Amen. Now I don't want you to be like one woman that came after a service like this. This woman came up to me and she said, Sister Hammond, I've, I, I've given him up. I've given him up. She says, the Lord has called me out to China. And I, and this woman had about six children. And she says, I'm just ready to go. And I've given him up. And just the way she said it, I knew she was glad to get rid of him. <laughs> now, it's, it's not like that. When, when Abraham went through giving up Isaac, it just was like it was tearing the insides out of him. This was something that he loved more than anything else on earth. But he brought that and put it on the altar and gave it up and consecrated it to God. What, is, what means more to you than anything else in the world? Our own right to ourselves. Our own right to ourselves. I'm going to have my own way. Young people, that, that, that can get you in trouble, Kim. I'm going to have my own way. Let me out of here. I'm going to have my own way. And after a while, we, we don't want to have our own way. Take my will. Take my life, Jesus. Take it. And we surrender it to him. Parents, put your children on the altar. That's the best place in the world for them. The best place in the world. All your possessions, everything that you own, all of your money, all of your property, everything else, give it to God. And after we've given up everything, you can give up your wife and give up your husband, give up your children, give up your cars, give up your bank account. Then we've got to give up ourselves and lay down our right to our own life and our right to our own will and our right to our own power of choosing. Give it up and lay it down. And Jesus said concerning the I came to do thy will, O Father. My meat and my drink is to do the will of him that sent. All right, and we take our life and give it to God, and that's when we bury it. That's when we bury it. Let's bury it. Let's bury it. Let's get rid of it. Let's bury it. We're going to get rid of it, except the corn of wheat fall in the ground and die. It abideth alone. It abideth. But if it die, it begins, begins to bring forth fruit. And something else begins to happen. Now that's the last that we mention the bold because we committed it to death. 
Do you know for the new life, the new Christ life to come forth, do you know that old bulb deteriorates and deteriorates and weakens and weakens and deteriorates and rots? It, it rots and becomes fertilizer for the new growth to come forth. Do you know that? How can the Christ life come forth in me? How can I be like Christ? Folks say, I want to be spiritual. How can I be spiritual? How can, how can I be a real Christian? Well, as the old weakens, the old nature, the old self-life, old carnality weakens, you see, the life of Christ in us strengthens and becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. We feed on Christ. We feed on his word. And the expression is him. Now, when, when you plant your garden and, and plant all of your tulip bulbs in the earth and you invite me over a month from now to see your garden. Are you going to say to me, Oh, Sister Hammond, come see my bulbs. Come see how my bulbs grow. You going to say that? What are you going to see? Why, of course, you're going to say, Come see my tulips. Come see my tulips. The old bulb is gone. The old bulb is buried. We're done with the bulb. We're not... We're not dealing with the bulb. Now, we're dealing with life. Now, I want to tell you something. You know, there are several churches and movements, and we went through a period when, when there was a number of speakers going around the country, and there's a number of churches that preached death to self, death to self, and crucifixion, and crucifixion. And when every time you come to church, you, you will hear a message on, now you must die. Now you have to die. And the next time you come back to church, you hear another sermon on, you have to die. Now you must die. And all the holiness movements and the Missionary Alliance and the Nazarene and the Wesleyan Methodist and all of those beautiful churches, beautiful movements that had that had a beautiful, a beautiful revelation and, and a truth, but not the whole truth. They just had a truth of the death side. We do have to die. We do have to fall in the ground and die. We do have to renounce that old nature. We have to be judged carnality and be done with it. But I... I came up and was growing during this period and I read all the books on this subject and all the truths on this subject and my heart was crying to God and I, Lord, please help me, please. I read Jesse Penn Lewis, I read Jesse Penn Lewis, death, 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 death. Surely there's more to it than this. And one day the Lord said to me, I did not say, consider the lily, how it dies. But what did he say? Thank you, honey. Say it out loud. Oh, say it nice and loud. That's better. Consider the lily, how it what? How it grows. How it grows. We're not going to talk about the bulb anymore, but we're going to talk about this new life in Christ Jesus. Christ liveth in me. Say it again, everybody. Oh, no, I don't want you to say it like that. I don't like that. I don't like that. You sounds like you're dying. <laughs> now I want you to say it like you're living.
that you won't be tempted. You're going to be tempted in all kinds of ways. But when you, you are put in the temptation and feel the porcupine needles begin to rise up within you, you say, no, I'm not going that way. That's the old life. That's that old carnal thing. I renounce that. I'm through with that. And I've surrendered my life to Jesus Christ for him to live out his life in me. And here is when we partake of his grace and turn to his, na his nature, not the nature of our parents, which, which is that old carnal thing sold under sin, we're not going to live in that anymore. We're a new creation in Christ Jesus. And we're going to let Christ live out his life in us. All right, now I want to show you something. We know very little about heaven, don't we? Say yes. And we know very little about hell, really, don't we? Yes. Do you know why? Because Jesus did not preach heaven and hell. Jesus didn't preach, do this and you'll go to hell, and don't do this and you'll go to heaven. That's not his gospel. He didn't vibrate between heaven and hell. Jesus preached life or death. Life or death. Do this and you die. But eat me and you live. And you live. Now, if we turn back to that old carnal life and feed the old self life, and listen, dear, listen, listen to me. You have to guard this holy treasure in this earthen vessel. It's the most precious thing in your life, dear. I want to tell you, this is all that you will be and what you will be. What you allow this life of Christ in you to develop into that and that only is what you will be in the countless ages of eternity. It is given to us now and now alone to suffer for him, to make our choices and decisions for him, to renounce that old selfish carnal life full of the devil and full of hell and full of death. It has death in it. And the moment you turn to carnality and let it express itself immediately, you touch death and you feel death in you, don't you? Say yes. How do you feel if you've given way to anger? How do you feel? Say something. Yes. Thank you. Uh, yes. Yeah. Because it is full of death. That thing is full of death. It's full of hell. And it causes the spiritual man to, to, to really be embarrassed and to receive. He has no part in that. There's, there's none of that in Jesus Christ. But how many of you know there is a time to be angry? When, when are we angry? Tell me. Tell me when we can be angry. You are right, honey. Shout it out. Oh, it's, it's, say it until Art hears you in the back seat. Yes. Yes, the Bible says, be angry and sin not. Now, when, when I say we have to die to anger, but we die to that ex the carnal expression of anger, but God's not going to come down and pull all the anger out of your root branch so that you can't get angry anymore. Because you, you wouldn't be fit for anything then. But he's going to leave that, the anger's there. But it must be rightly directed. And what is it when I say, when I, when I say, I rebuke you, Satan! You've got to have some anger in you. Glory to God.
No, he doesn't. In fact, the Lord doesn't pull any of that out of it. He, you know, how many of you have trouble with temper? Oh, come on, fess up. Come on, fess up. All right? All right? You have trouble with temper. And I hear people down at the altar. Oh, God, tears fill. Take the temper out of me. Oh, God, take this temper out of me. I go over and stand over them and I say, Jesus, don't chance that prayer. <laughs> don't you answer that prayer, Jesus. Don't you, if you take the temper out of them, they won't be fit for anything. That reminds me on the mission field. When I was in India, one of the missionaries had a nervous breakdown. And we called in one of the national workers to help us pray for it. And we asked him to lead in prayer. So he says, Dear Jesus, please take the nervous system out of mama. <laughs> well, I suppose Jesus would have taken, just pulled the nervous system out of her. And I had, I could see all the roots and the branches, you know, of all this nervous system being pulled out. And I said, oh, no, Lord, don't do that. Don't answer that prayer. And that's the way I feel when people are at the altar saying, Jesus, take the temper out of me. I'm, Lord, don't answer that prayer. They wouldn't be fit for anything. So you fellas, if you're going to build something and you need some good stuff, Steel. What kind of steel you want? That's right, you want some good steel with some temper in it. Why? You want that strength. You want strength. So the Lord doesn't take the temper out of us, he rightly directs it. And, and you young people, I want you to be full of temper. And when that old devil comes around and tempts you, you know since you are saved and baptized in the Spirit, you're a lot of little princess. You know that? And prince, and I want you to stomp your royal foot and shake your little royal fist and say in the presence of the devil, No! I'm not going that way. I love Jesus Christ with all of my heart. I love him. I'm going to serve him. I'm going to live for him. I worship him. I want nothing more to do with you. No! That's temper. Do you want to scream? Do you feel like screaming? No! That's temper. I'm not going that way. And today you have to say that every day that you live. Not only young people, all of us. There are, there are 10,000 things that come against you today to take you away from Jesus Christ and our God. In conversation, you have to say, No! No! I'm not going to fill my lips with that kind of conversation. No! I'm not listening to that criticism. No! I'll have no part in this gossip. No! I'm not going to read that kind of literature. No! I'm not going to spend my time like that. No! And you constantly have to say, no, no, no. I'm not going that way. Not only out there in the world, I want to tell you there's plenty in religious circles today. There's in religious circles. I get in situations in religious circles. I say, no, no. No! I'm not going that way. I'm not interested in that thing. I would rather go and work in a selling ribbon in a dime store than be taken up with just a religious program. No! No! I want to be where God is and move with God and what God is in and what God is doing and move with God and the precious Holy Spirit. Amen! Say amen. amen. Say amen. amen. Yes, yeah, let everything in you go out to Jesus Christ and say, yes, Lord, that's me. Yes, that's what I that's the way I feel. Yes, that's the way I'm going. I'm gonna walk with God and live in the Spirit and let Jesus Christ come forth in me. Amen. Oh, for God's sake.
sake, let Jesus free you in your home. Free you in your home that there's communication in the home. Where husbands and wives can talk freely together about the Lord. And communicate together. Worship together. Let the incense rise daily in your home. Where you're free to worship and sing and pray and rejoice. Keep the atmosphere free and open in your home. Parents, let your children know you're a mother of prayer. You're a father of prayer. Let them have memories of hearing your voice in prayer. Keep the communication lines open between you and your children that they'll come to you for prayer, that the children will feel free to worship and speak in tongues and adore the Lord. Sit at the table and break out in tongues or... S oh, I don't know. Some homes I get into, I hear them say to the children, no, 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 you're at the table now. We can't, we can't sing at the table. I would just like to say, then sings my let it go. Let it go. In season and out of season. Huh? Yes. And worship and love and adore the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. amen. Say amen. amen. Well, now this is this, so we have to keep it, keep it in character for what it is. But aren't you glad when the Holy Ghost comes in and just busts the thing up? Say amen. amen. Yes. When the Holy Ghost gets into it, that's what makes it good. And that's what you remember. That's what you remember. When the life of the Spirit came in there. When I was preaching in Wales, they would tell me sometimes, they'd say, and the Holy Ghost got into it. <laughs> well, I like that. The Holy Ghost got into one of their street meetings. And and they sang in the spirit and was heard for seven miles away. And people for seven miles around begin, came to find out where this beautiful singing was coming from. And of course a revival broke out. That was in Crosby's in Wales. But let that old thing die and the new life in Christ Jesus express itself and it becomes more and more and more and more and more beautiful. And you and I become changed and changed and changed. Now, I'll, I'll just give you this one word and then I'll close. There are seven changes that take place in our life. While we're being changed from a bulb into a tulip, or while we're being changed from a natural man into a spiritual man. There's seven changes. Seven is what kind of a number? <laughs> Thank you, that's right. Seven is the perfect number. All right. We are changed from what? That's it. Say it out loud. We are changed from glory to glory. We are changed from the glory of the bulb to the glory of the stem. Then we're changed from the glory of the stem to the glory of the stalk. We're changed from the glory of the stalk to the glory of the leaf. We're changed from the glory of the leaf to the glory of the bud. We're changed from the glory of the bud to the glory of the flower. And then that is changed back again to the same likeness of that which made possible this whole new creation. There's seven changes. Now, if you come back tomorrow night, I'll tell you how we get changed. I've got to stop. It's nine o'clock. All right. Did you hear anything tonight that might help you? Oh, for God's sake, hate that old thing and let Jesus come forth in us in his glory, in his beauty. Do you love Jesus? Yes. All right. Let's talk about Jesus. Say his name. 
Jesus. Well, let's talk about just in one word. Can you in one word or two words tell me the most beautiful thing you can think of about Jesus? Now, I expected you young people to say that. I just, and what do you think they said? Yeah. And didn't you expect them to say that? They all want to be loved. I just love to come down and hug every one of you. Jesus has changed you, hasn't he? Isn't he beautiful? Isn't he wonderful? Yes. Gee, he is love. He is love. What else is he? Peace. Have you found peace in Jesus? Yes, he is peace. What else is he? What? You're secure in Jesus. Yes, brother. Security. What else is Jesus to you? Hmm? He's your Savior. He's your Savior. What else is He? Well, that's what we're talking about, isn't it? He is our life. He that hath the song hath life. Then let's not have any more death in our meeting. And they all said, yes. sure, it was meetings that are full of life, full of life, in a land flowing. Just be free to praise the Lord. Be free to worship. Be free to adore. Get the victory over other people and what they're going to say and think. And just love and worship Jesus. I wonder if the song is in this book, Jesus is all the world to me. My life, my joy, my all. He is my strength. From Thank you for finding it for us, brother. He is my strength from day to day. Without him, I would fall. What did you say? When I'm sad to him, I go. No other one can cheer me so. <laughs> Following him, I know I'm right. He watches for me day and night. That's 477. Shall we stand? And let's, let's just sing it to Jesus. Sing it to Jesus. Did you get blessed tonight? Yeah. You did. Well, do you know? Do you know we can bless the Lord? Do you know we can? Do you know we can refresh the presence of the Lord? The Bible says Abraham refreshed the presence of the Lord. And you know, man, it's many times in meetings, I'll say, well, now let's not go any further until we minister to Jesus. Let's just minister to him and just forget ourselves for a little while and just minister to Jesus and bless him. Like one, one little preacher's boy, mommy was helping him say his prayers and oh, I just love this little fellow. And she says, honey, now, and I'll say your prayer. And he said his little prayer, God bless mommy and daddy. God bless my sister Esther. And she says, now, do you want to say amen? No. Well, she said, say whatever you want to say. And he hesitated for a while, and she says, go on, Charlie, say whatever you want to say. He says, God bless yourself. <laughs> <laughs> amen. So let's bless the Lord while we sing his all the world. And will you sing it like he is all the world to you? All right, brother.
to number three and sing the last verse. Change 